The Grand Basilica, once a sanctuary of hope and faith, now stood as a solemn monument to the impending pale doom which surrounded the Imperium on Axum. Within its hallowed walls, a gathering of desperate soldiers clung to fast-fading threads of faith, hands reaching out for answers, and the hope they sought to find within those answers. The sisters, resolute as ever, suffered no indignity of doubt, but they were far from the only ones present. Saint Lazarus, newly appointed and burdened with duty and doubts great enough to shatter a soul, stood before them, his heart heavy beneath his resolute spirit. He had faced battle and death, but this moment, this choice, tested his newfound mantle of leadership. A mantle he feared he would soon be surrendering into the frigid maw of the afterlife. Clad in humble sackcloth adorned with flak armor, Lazarus bore the scars of war openly. Already he had lost an arm and a leg to this battle, both limbs claimed by merciless violence, replaced now with finely made mechanical prosthetics. They served as constant reminders of his questionable mortality, of the fragility of flesh, both his own and that of all of those who looked up towards him as he took his place at the elevated pulpit. Yet he wore them with a fierce determination, for he knew that the essence of a saint lay not in a physical body, but within the indomitable spirit that blazed inside. And the mob of men and women before him did not deserve anything less than a saint. Not a man mired in doubts, not a fool elevated by circumstance to where he should not have served, not a coward weighed down by uncertainty and fear. The news he now sought to deliver demanded a saint, and so a saint he would be. He held the turmoil that churned within his chest and stomach tight through the twin vices of discipline and the truest sense of duty. Taking a deep breath, Lazarus began. My brothers and sisters, soldiers of the Imperium, I stand before you today, a vessel of the God Emperor's will and his ineffable plan. This world faces an imminent threat, one that demands a terrible sacrifice. The evacuation efforts we have labored to organize have been cut short by the looming specter of annihilation. He announced loudly, his words bringing silence to all those assembled. Beside him stood two figures. Canoness Commander Leandra Ordain, her presence a pillar of unwavering faith, and First Captain Heldris Torv of the Tempered Hands Space Marine Chapter. A symbol of resolute power, both representatives of the faith, scions of victory. Lazarus drew strength from their support as he gazed upon the varied forces of the Imperium gathered before him. Sisters of battle, Imperial guardsmen, and support staff from all walks of life awaited his words. Most looked up at him, their gazes filled with desperate hope, hope he was not able to deliver. A ripple of apprehension spread through the Basilica as his pronouncement began. But Lazarus pressed on, his face tight around the hideous burns he had received when the replique had ambushed him. I stand here not to dictate your fate, but to offer you a choice. As I am sure you have all heard by now, it is true that the final salvation within the Basilica has been prematurely unleashed. Six hundred valiant souls must remain behind, their duty to face the calamity that awaits us. In the face of an unleashed virus bomb, death will be certain, and the sacrifice absolute. Should the virus bomb fail to activate, the forces of the Galactic Republic will descend upon us, their overwhelming numbers and witch knights, an imminent threat, and one that 600 of us will be unable to overcome. The room fell into a heavy silence, each soldier grappling with the enormity of the decision thrust upon them. Lazarus continued speaking through it all, for he knew he could not, no, would not, ask of others what he himself would not do. And so, with ice like steel flowing through his veins, the new saint held nothing back. I will stand with you, shoulder to shoulder, among the six hundred who remain. 
It is a burden I do not ask lightly, for I too am prepared to return to the Emperor's side once more before I abandon any to fight alone. Together, we shall become either an unbreakable shield or a bloody testament to the unwavering loyalty that burns within the heart of humanity. This is the Emperor's home, and I shall not allow the Republic to desecrate it with impunity. As Lazarus finished speaking, his gaze traveled across the faces of those assembled, seeking volunteers, the truest and bravest among them. His heart ached with the knowledge that many lives would be altered by his choice, that loved ones would be left behind. But amidst the uncertainty he beheld, he also saw flickers of determination ignite within the eyes of his soldiers, and those scant flames lent heat to his own. Gritting a mouth full of true and false teeth, the Imperial Saint nodded his head. Step forth, honored brethren, and let your courage shine! Do not heed the call out of blind devotion, but out of the conviction born of your own will. Together we shall defy the darkness and ignite a beacon of hope, a flame that will guide future generations in the face of the adversary. Rally your spite! Harness your rage! Kindle your faith! If death faces us today, then let us face it as true scions of humanity! If we must die, then let us all die standing! He yelled into the echoing spaces of the filled basilica. Before him was an ocean of varied soldiers, from Calambians, Vastelans, and Ogrins, to Sisters of Battle, Tempestus Scions, and the largely wounded Cadians and Kriegers. Even the remaining stormtroopers who had been under Shadrach's command were among them, stripped of their weapons and standing at ease only paces away from those who had fought against them. These men puzzled Lazarus, as it was they who had helped launch the bomb that would end the world. And yet, they seemed all too happy to take his orders once they had heard of Commissar Shadrick's apparent success. In spite of their role in the crisis they all now faced, they were among the first to step forward, the first to volunteer their lives. Among the first, but not the only ones, not by far. Over 600 loyal soldiers of the Imperium stepped forward, as well as a hefty number of the support staff, and Lazarus smiled down at them, a grim, but proud expression he did not try to hide. Now he would only have to choose whom to spare from this sacrifice, as opposed to whom he would need to offer up to it. Leandra stepped forward, raising her newly acquired hand flamer and issuing a blast of fire into the air over their heads. For Emperor and Imperium! She cried out, and the faithful answered her. For Emperor and Imperium! For Emperor and Imperium! For Emperor and Imperium! Hey there, fellow fans. Fan with too much time here. Hoping that you are enjoying this episode of Star Wars vs. Warhammer 40k, The Light Flickers, Part 1. Please forgive uh, the interlude here in the middle of the episode, um, but I am compelled to remind everybody about my current project, the project on which a lot of my creative future may very well hinge. I have recently released the Kickstarter for my latest comic book project, Song and Stone, and currently I'm about halfway through my Kickstarter run, um, but regretfully um, I've only made about um, a little under $900 with 16 backers. There are a lot more than 16 viewers on this video, and I am asking, though I'm not asking for much, if you could find it in you to donate even $1 to my Kickstarter, if even a quarter of the people watching this would do that for me, um, it would allow me to move forward with my professional life as well as with this fan fiction. I, I hate to beg and I hate to plea, but things are getting really tight and close over here, and if I can't succeed this Kickstarter, then I have to, um, well, I, I have to reassess a lot of the uh, ways that I go forward with things, um, just because 
After all, while this is fun, and while making Star Wars vs. Warhammer 40k is a lot of fun, and it's a, a, a passion project of mine, um, it doesn't get me anywhere. It's not something that I can ever show on a resume. It's not something that convinces uh, creative companies or works or investors to invest in me. Um, for that, I need other demonstrations of, uh, of, of some kind of creative success. And this is really important in that regard. So I know that it comes off as a little pleady, and please forgive me for that. Um, but it is quite literally a, a big part of my creative future on the line. But if you can find it in you, if you think... And again, the comic book is free. You can check out the comic uh, in the description down below for free to see if you think it's worth anything. Um, and if you think it is worth something, consider donating even a single dollar. A single dollar, especially from all of you, would take me so much farther. Um, as per the rules of Kickstarter, if I can't reach my goal, much less my stretch goals, then all of the money is simply returned, and I'm, I'm left at square one with a rather large uh, expenditure for having created the comic in the first place. Um, so... Please, if you're enjoying this series, if you want to support the writer and, and my creative works and my creative continuation, please consider checking out the comic. Please consider um, donating even a single dollar to this project. It means the world to me. It's so important. Um, if you don't have, I understand. Um, but again, all I ask for is a small donation. There are so many fellow fans here. There are so many people who are enjoying these creative universes and the work that I produce. If you've been enjoying it for one hour, two hour, eight hours, 12 hours uh, or more, consider uh, providing just a little bit of backing to this project to, 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 to help me continue, basically. Um, and you've already all heard the spiel. Uh, I have aspirations to be a truly independent uh, creative writer. I don't want to have a uh, a company or a specific power system breathing down my neck to alter my uh, my narratives into something that isn't what I was going out to do. But for that, I need freedom to produce what I think is important and and creative to produce. And to have that freedom, I need to be able to make some money for myself. I'm, I need to be able to be profitable in some way, or at least to get back a little bit of what I spent making the comics, um, because it hasn't been easy to do it all by myself. This is all self-published. Um, if you agree with that sort of approach, if you think it's the best way for a creator like myself to go forward, then please consider donating some amount to the Song and Stone project, the Kickstarter, which you can find in the description down below. Thank you for your support, and now I will return you to The Light Flickers, Part 1. Please enjoy. The spires of Axum trembled, the towering skyscrapers becoming the stage for a desperate struggle between forces from both local and foreign galaxies. Captain Fordo charged up a flight of wide stairs and paused every couple of steps to lean over the railing and look up. On the first, second, and third times he did this, he saw nothing, but the fourth answered his inspection with a rain of cracking, cascading autocannon fire. He threw himself back as the railing was consumed by the raining shots, the revving of the cannon's barrels having been his only saving grace. Move up, move up! He ordered his men, signaling for them to hug the walls, three of them unslinging their PLX missile launchers while two others prepped and cooked smoke grenades. Fordo counted down their retaliation with his fingers, making a fist and pulling in his arm with a jerk when it was time. The grenades were tossed, but the instant they started spewing gas, two titanic forms swung down from the flight of stairs above them, their massive bodies billowing the smoke. The clone captain had only moments to see them. Space Marines. Each one holding a one-handed sparking hammer while they used their other hands to perform the maneuver, moving like agile gundarks. We need sabers now. Fordo yelled into his comm. 
his voice drowned out by the expelling thunder that came from the two space marines smashing the missile-wielding clones into paste. One of the three managed to get their shot off towards the upper staircase, but whether it landed a kill or not was not something that Fordo could confirm, too busy sliding to the ground and out of the way of a pulverizing swing. The hammer shattered steel and plaster over the captain's head, Fordo unloading his DC-15 into the marine above him, shots pinging and splashing against the monster's obscured purple and silver armor. Damn it! He cried out, rolling down the stairs and into several other clones as he evaded the following stomp. He released his DC-15 as he did, letting it fall from his grasp as he wrangled another weapon from its sling holster on the chest of another clone. The new weapon was a grenade launcher, and as Fordo heard the sound of crunching bones and plastoid coming from the third missile-bearing clone he had summoned, he fired the weapon he had commandeered into the billowing smoke before him. The launcher made a thwoomp sound as it lobbed its explosive out, catching the marine in the chest and clearing the smoke for a brief instant as the super soldier was thrown back by the force of it. In that short-lived moment of clarity, the other marine could be seen as well, red eye lenses shining with a malevolent light as the smoke spilled back in, surrounding its advancing body. Fordo made to fire a second shot, but the familiar sound of lightsabers activating forestalled him. Three Jedi leapt into the smoke, bodies spinning and twirling over the heads of the stalled clones, sabers bright and burning. They landed and began to weave and battle with the two space marines, clearing the smoke through the use of their speed and powers. To say nothing of the shimmering exhalations released by the hammers wielded by the marines as they endeavored to pulverize their Jedi assailants. Three dueled two as the Astartes began to retreat back up the stairs, giving ground, one of them injured thanks to Fordo's quick thinking. Injured but far from felled. The Marines backed up to a certain point, the Jedi eagerly chasing them, while Fordo had five more PLXs brought to the front. Just as the experienced clone had expected, the Marines were only retreating to their own benefit, luring the Jedi into another crossfire, holding them locked in melee while nine other Space Marines opened fire from across the staircase above them. Their barking, exploding bolter rounds began to fall with distinct accuracy among the Jedi, wounding and then killing one while the other two cartwheeled back, narrowly avoiding the roaring death of both thunderous hammers and detonating steel. And when they did, Fordo was ready. Fire! He yelled, grenades and missiles being lobbed up towards the two melee-oriented Astartes, while a second group with only missile launchers leaned out from the railings and fired into the cluster of space marines which had been using their bolters from above. The two space marines before them seemed to have expected the action, both leaping into the wall, slamming their hammers into it and breaking through the metal and into the adjacent floor. The other space marines were less prepared, but pulled back nonetheless, and again, Fordo was unable to confirm how many had died from the counterattack. The Jedi's remains were recovered, at least as much as they could be, before the clone captain directed a hefty portion of his forces to pursue the two marines, while the rest continued up. The last thing he wanted was for the enemy to be running rampant while behind them were in their flanks. Somewhere to the rear of their forces was Jedi Master Opo Rancisis, organizing their continuing strategy and lending his power to all of the clones and Jedi through the use of battle meditation. Fordo could feel it even then, a subtle but powerful extra sense falling over him, making his reflexes faster, his hunches more accurate, his predictions nearly prophetic. And even with all of that, they were only making ground through bad attrition. As the clone forces had engaged the Space Marines, General Rancisis had insisted on breaking their larger force into five separately led assault formations. Together, working in perfect sync, the Republic had punched through in various places and had begun to force the Marines back. It was both easier and harder than Fordo had imagined it would be. On the one hand, the Space Marines had not suffered any confirmed kills, though several had been observed to be wounded. This was not because of how invincible they were, but rather how readily they retreated in the face of combat. It seemed almost cowardly to the clone captain. The Astartes seemingly unwilling to place themselves into prolonged danger with the advancing Republic. 
abandoning their defensive positions within seconds of them being contested. In that way, the advance had been easy, with the captain spotting several holdout locations which, upon even brief inspection, revealed themselves to be advantageous kill zones for the Astartes. If they had chosen to hold their ground in these places, they would have killed many clones and Jedi, almost certainly forcing the attacking assault formations to seek another way around them rather than fight through them. Fordo expected that they were being lured into some kind of trap or ambush, and thus continued to check for them, advancing at pace but with caution. Yet thus far, the ambushes they had been pitted against had proven to be brief affairs, reaping losses on the Republic to be sure, but nowhere near the amount that would be needed to bleed them dry from attrition. Slowly but surely, the Astartes were allowing themselves to be cornered at the top of the tower. And yet, on the other hand, the very steel of the spires they fought within was shaken every few moments. PLX missile launchers bellowed within the deep confines of the city construct, bolters barking back in response as every inch of contested ground was steadily drenched in crimson blood. While it would not be enough to stop them, the Space Marines, despite their continuous withdrawal, were killing clones all the way up the tall spire. Fordo had never faced warriors like these, soldiers of this caliber, and it helped nothing that their armor and weapons were so absurdly powerful. Anything less than 12 blasters on one target was simply not enough to be considered an even subpar offensive measure. And that was only when considering the average Space Marine, something Fordo already knew was not the only possible kind. And yet, in open spite of their losses, the roaring clones under his command were steadily gaining ground, shoving the Astartes back, floor by gore-slicked floor. The purple and silver-clad Space Marines unleashed their devastating weaponry with unyielding precision and brutality, their many guns howling, death echoing through the cavernous halls they were retreating up. Standing tall over their adversaries, the Space Marines Fordo had been facing seemed to possess physical strength and speed that was nigh unmatched by any save the best of the Jedi who dared to confront them. To Fordo's growing rage, every Space Marine they wounded appeared to come at the cost of ten clones. The white Phase II armors of their advancing Republic forces too often stained with the sacrifice of their comrades. Yet even so, the clones fought on their sheer numbers overwhelming the more stubborn holdouts which the tempered hands occasionally attempted. Fordo came across one such rare situation now, as he came to a place where the Space Marines had destroyed the entire staircase for several feet going up. At the rim of the other side of the severed staircase was a rough barricade of metal made from the very staircase they had destroyed, and, standing behind it, a Space Marine with an enormous slug-throwing gun linked directly into a bulky, ammunition-bearing backpack. Onto this floor, now! Fordo yelled, ducking into the door which led off into the current floor he was on. The clone smashed through it with a lunge, saving himself and several others near him as the Space Marine rained death into the front line of his assault force. The horrible sound of his heavy weapon churning clone troopers into mulch filled the air painfully, but Fordo did not let it distract him did not stop moving, even for a second. Still bearing his stolen grenade launcher, he popped a high explosive round into the chamber and aimed it into the ceiling above him. Another thwoomp sounded shortly before a massive explosion blew a hole into the floor above. Fordo slung the launcher and checked his special issue gauntlets. The liquid cable dispenser that facilitated his cord whip and grappling line was still intact and functional on his left arm and on his right, the deployable, knuckle-mounted vibroblade extended and retracted smoothly. The clone captain aimed his gauntlet up at the hole, firing his cable and rappelling up past it in a matter of seconds. He activated his helmet light, finding himself in a dark series of offices which ran beside the stairs. Checking a holodisc briefly for a map of the place, he took off running, able to orient himself easily thanks to the loud, continuous roar of fire that the Space Marine was letting loose with. Fordo turned a corner and kicked open a door, finding both what he desired and what he had desired to avoid at the same exact time. Across the wide room from Fordo, 
was the open door which led out into the staircase above the murderous marine. For his counterattack to work, he would need to reach it to blindside the Astartes who was killing his men. However, before the stairway entrance stood a pair of space marines, both also holding massively enormous guns, one which glowed a radioactive blue, and the other which had a lensed barrel that was thicker than Fordo's arm. Both looked up at him briefly, a pause passing between the three soldiers before the Astartes raised and angled their weapons up to blast him. He ran straight for the two, counting to three in his head, before dropping down into a slide. The space marines fired in coordination, one issuing forth a gout of glowing blue plasma, which arched over Fordo the nearness of its passing, darkening his armor as it drank in the heat. The other fired a thick beam of light, which atomized the air above Fordo's head, leaving a deep, molten hole where he had been moments earlier. The captain rolled back up to his feet, blade extending from his clenched fist. Salamander, I need you and your squad all missiled up at the front, now! He ordered into his helmet as he ran. That's suicide. The clone on the other end of the comm began to protest as Captain Fordo came up on the two space marines. They were encumbered by the size of their huge weapons, and they did not seem to have the time to fire them off once more, so they took positions to swing the weapons like clubs. Any such strike more than enough to crush a man flat. Fordo weaved as he approached, angling towards one of the two marines, before breaking off at the last moment, again dropping to skid, nearly losing an arm as one marine swung high and missed him, while the other slammed its weapon low, hardened barrel of the gun denting the metal ground an inch from Captain Fordo's left arm. Do it now, Manda! That is an order! Await my command to fire! Fordo roared into his helmet, speeding past the two marines, knowing their eyes and weapons were not far behind him. But he did not have far to go, reaching out to catch the side of the doorway with his left arm as Fordo ran into the stairway, swinging himself downward to the left. And there was the marine, already halting his fire, already informed by his comrades in the other room that a clone was coming up on him from behind. Had he been a normal space marine, Fordo would not have stood a chance, but the Astartes which had been devastating his troopers was not armed like the standard marine. Heavy weapon in hand, massive ammunition backpack burdening him, the marine was slower than the others, and the captain, for all his lack of augmentations, was bred from the greatest bounty hunter in the galaxy. And even more than his brothers, Fordo was fast, and Fordo was lethal. He ran, his feet clanging on the steel floor, and leapt, reeling his right arm back. The space marine finished his turn, began to fire, raising the line of his weapons aimed to try to catch the airborne clone. But the marine had aimed to compensate for Fordo running down the stairs, not jumping from the top of them, and even as he corrected his aim, bolts firing one after the other from his massive gun, he knew it was too late. Fordo felt time freezing as the marine's bulky upper body sped towards him. His fist and protruding, humming vibroblade reeled back. The clone had only one shot, one chance, and he knew it, so he took it. The captain led his landing with his fist, punching into the eye lens of the space marine and driving the fist-mounted blade in as deeply as it would go. The hungering weapon buzzed as it chewed into the vulnerable armoring, sliding through auspex sensors and ceramite, turning metal and more into powder. If Fordo had merely punched the marine in the face, this would have been as far as his cut would have taken him, but with the added force of his weight and momentum from his jump, the blade burst the inner layering and drove directly into the marine's face. He sliced through the Astartes' eye, the vibroblade buzzing as it met the Marine's hardened skull, and though it did not penetrate far into that, it still proved lethal. The high-frequency vibrations of the blade, now anchored into the unyielding skull of the Super Soldier, performed a deadly sonic lobotomy, turning gray matter into pulp as the blade normally did with flesh. 
Blood spurted from the Astartes' remaining eye and nose. His last thoughts literally obliterated as he began to slump and fall. But even as the Marine died, the other two were making ready to avenge him, coming out onto the staircase and aiming their weapons. Mander, the door onto the floor above me. Fire now! Fordo ordered as he began to yank his fist free of the now dead Space Marine. Aye! Satlamander yelled from below, his whole squad raising their weapons and letting loose the volley of missile fire. Rumbling curses in their own language, the Marines withdrew hastily, narrowly avoiding the cascade of explosions and pulling back as the others of their kind had done. Lines were fired and set up, the clones scaling up the hole the captain had created and across the gap in short order. Fordo sat down as his forces began to move across the barrier, taking a moment to remove his helmet, drinking water from a canteen before dumping some of it over his head. His heart still hammered, and his thoughts were still troubled. What were the Space Marines playing at? Why not just stop and confront them in proper force? It felt like they were being lured, but could he be sure of that? So consumed was he by these thoughts that Captain Fordo did not realize the stares he was getting until he ended his brief break and stood back up, raising his helmet to place it back on and pausing. All around him, helmed faces were turned his way, and in a much more transfixed manner than he was used to, even when filling a command role. He scowled and lowered his helmet over his features. What's the matter? Something wrong with my face, troopers? He snapped at them. In response, they slowly parted, making room between him and the fallen Space Marine. Captain, you killed it, said a nearby clone. There was a brief pause then as Fordo loosely nodded his head. Yeah, I plan to be doing a lot more of that before this is done. He said, cocking open the grenade launcher he still bore and sliding in an armor-piercing round. How about you, troopers? You gonna stand around gawking at a dead imp? Or are you gonna do your jobs and help me finish this? He challenged back, and his clones roared in response. He sighed heavily and rubbed at his eyes, feeling them ache almost as much as the numbed, burn-patch-covered side of his scorched face. The new saint felt old, sitting wearily in the dimly lit office, his gaze fixed on the towering stacks of paperwork that detailed the fate of far over a mere six hundred valiant souls. The weight of their lives pressed heavily upon him as his prosthetic arm traced lines on the evacuation roster, determining who would be saved from the impending doom of the virus bomb or the merciless onslaught of the Republic. The room was filled with an air of solemnity, broken only by the sound of a sharp knock that cut through the heavy silence. Jumping a little in shock, and wondering if it was one of the guards who stood outside the doors, Lazarus cracked his neck, secretly happy to entertain any minor distraction if it offered him a reprieve from his current duty. Enter! He called, his voice carrying a weight within it that he could scarcely mask. Commissar Jane Lee Ross marched inside, her rigid demeanor and stiff uniform matching the no-nonsense tone of her voice. The red and black garbed commissar saluted the saint with crisp precision as she began to speak. Holiness, I hope I am not disturbing you. Lazarus shook his head and beckoned her further in, gesturing towards one of the chairs seated before the ornate wooden desk he now occupied. Jane strode three steps closer, but did not sit. Instead, continuing to speak, I have an odd matter to discuss with you. If there had been too many instances of this, I would never think to bring it to your attention, but there is just one, so I decided to bring this instance to you personally. Lazarus raised an eyebrow at that, setting down his auto quill. Instance of what? Lazarus asked. Jane seemed to stumble a little there, as if trying to find the right words to answer with before resuming, her voice stuttering somewhat as she began. That there is a soldier demanding to speak with you. He wants you to change his assignment within the evacuation roster. At this, the saint sighed and nodded, raising his quill again. Many more than they needed had volunteered, 
so he was barely shocked by this occurrence. Right. A few of them were bound to lose their nerve. I'm surprised you didn't handle this yourself. But given that you have brought this to me personally, I suppose it means nothing to reassign him to a ship heading out. What is his name? Lazarus asked, but Jane shook her head at him. It's not that, Holiness. This man, he refuses to accept his evacuation assignment and is insisting on a chance to convince you to change your decision, to assign him into the 600, not out of them. She explained. Well, that is rather unexpected. What is his name, his assignment and position? Lazarus asked, putting the quill back down and making ready to sort through the rosters before him. His name is Farnus Eliton. He is assigned to the 174th Vastilian Imperial Irregulars, Munitorum designation 21411. She reported, Lazarus quickly sorting through as she spoke the information. Ah, here he is. Hmm, he's a kid. 19 solar cycles. Let's see. He's in the infantry. Ah, uh, squad is almost entirely KIA. Two of his group made it back to the Basilica, received treatment for their injuries. Shit. Lost one of them on the walls when the Republic began its Voidcraft bombardment. He's one of two left, Lazarus said as he read through the information before him. He looked up, brow askew. Why in Terra's name does he want to stay town here? He asked the Commissar. I am not completely sure, Holiness. I can try to explain it to you, but like I said, he is insisting, even to the point of risking his life, that he be allowed to speak with you. I can send him away if you prefer. Deal with this judgment myself. Jane offered, but the saint shook his head. With another sigh, Lazarus waved his hand and relented. No, no, it's fine. Send him in. The former major sighed suppressing a yawn as he did. After what he estimated to be at least 14 hours of combat, the sun on this dreadful planet was finally setting, the dying light shaded by a distant yet approaching storm. The stims helped to keep the saint aware, but even with them cycling in his blood, he doubted he'd be able to keep this up if night fell and the sound of falling rain permeated the air. He could only hope that the bomb, or the replique, would kill him before he fell unconscious. The door swung open, and Farnus Eliton stepped into the room, his nervousness palpable as he introduced himself. I am Farnus El... He began to say. Yes, yes, I know who you are, Lazarus said, cutting him off, skimming over his file briefly. The saint looked up at him, affecting a dubious expression. Vastelin? You hail from the 174th, correct? He asked, probing. Yes, sir, Farnes said, snapping a salute and nodding. Take a seat, Private Eliton, Lazarus ordered, gesturing towards a chair. He turned towards Commissar Leros as Farnes began to sit. You may leave us, Commissar. Close the door behind you. He dismissed with a nod of his head in her direction. Jane seemed to be about to protest, but bit her tongue and nodded, her expression softening slightly as she obeyed the saint's command. As you wish, holiness, she said as she exited the room, leaving Lazarus and Farnus alone in Ishtara's former office. Lazarus leaned forward, his tired eyes reviving, fixing the younger man with a piercing gaze. Why are you refusing the evacuation order, guardsman? He asked bluntly, making Farnus blush somewhat and shake his head. Oh, no, no, sir. Um, uh, ho holiness, it's not my intention to refuse any orders, sir. I just think I... I think I would be of more help to the Imperium here than up there. The soldier tried to explain. More help here? Do you not fear the virus bomb or the encroaching Republic? Both will kill you, likely kill us all, before the sun has another chance to rise. Farnus took a deep breath as the saint spoke and when he responded, his voice was laced with an unwavering reverence. I have heard the rumors, sir, about Ishtara and the Commissar and the bomb. And if Canonis Ordain herself assured us of safety, then I believe it, sir, he said, 
and Lazarus was almost struck by the earnestness he saw there. In fact, he would have been struck had this conversation not been about trapping this young man to die here and not to carry out his faith into a longer future. And the Republic? Lazarus pressed, making Farnus pale somewhat and swallow hard before responding. As for the Republic, I won't lie. I am afraid. But I believe there is still hope. Skepticism burned in Lazarus's eyes, and though he did not want to quash the boy's faith, he did not shy from challenging it. Explain, guardsman. Why do you believe the situation is not hopeless? Asked the saint, crossing his arms on top of the desk and leaning in a bit. Farnus hesitated for a moment, his hand delving into his pocket to retrieve a small, blood-stained prayer scroll. Lazarus eyed it, lifting an eyebrow and looking back up at the soldier for an explanation. Sir, my comrade, tech priest Nervous Sharp, she and I fought side by side within an Imperial Knight. We helped turn back the enemy from the Basilica Gates, fought alongside Ishtara Ordain herself. It was Nerva who saved the Canoness when we were all crushed beneath a fallen starship. I know it's hard to believe, but I am speaking only the truth. Faunus exclaimed, eyes wide, fully expecting to be disbelieved. I believe you, the saint said quickly and easily. Many eyes saw what you describe, so for now at least, let's say I believe you. But what about that makes you think we can defeat the Republic with 600 men alone? Lazarus asked. Well, we were left for dead after the crash, but Nerva and I were found and saved by a a Jedi Knight of the Republic, an abhuman woman who called herself Ahsoka Tano. <laughs> <laughs>